from New Jersey. Joe, however, as we mentioned, spends a lot of time here at Borgata. Yeah, it shows here a lot. Born and raised in Philadelphia. Zach from Pennsylvania as well. Zach also spends a lot of time here. He's been here for most of the recent series. Joe and Michael, the lone Philadelphia Eagles fans at the table. They will be rooting for the Eagles in a big game on Sunday. Michael coming in with a raise here with the uh, A7 offsuit. One of the lighter raises we've seen him make at this final table. Yeah, a little on the loose side. I don't think it's terrible uh, he's cut off, by right? any means. Uh, he's the hijack. No, definitely, definitely not terrible. Just lighter than he's been. Yeah. Because Zach is the button here, and they have Eric between them, so. Yeah, raise, raising a little bit lighter when the chip leader is the button and can fly you with hands like 10A suited is actually a little bit rough with A7 offsuit. It's just very hard to, uh, you know, to, to continue post flop the times the button flops you. This flop being a nice example of that. Sack reaching. What do you think about Zach's bet here? I think it's okay. He's pretty reasonable with the sizing yeah. he's chosen. I think he doesn't want to give a free card. He's going to be ahead a lot. Um, and then, you know, Justin's in a little bit of an awkward spot. Obviously, Justin's hand is strong enough to continue, but if he had a little bit worse of a hand, you know, he's wedged in between Zach and the cutoff, so that makes it slightly harder for him to continue. Stuff. Especially with two other players. You know, if it was a heads-up pot, I think checking is a little more reasonable. Um, but with, with two other players in the hand, you don't mind getting the fold. Even two folds would be great here. I think yeah. if I were Zach, I would I would check back the flop with that hand. I just expect uh, either player, if they continue to have better hands. I don't well, sometimes you need to protect, right? Like if you're betting small enough, you know, even the even if you're only getting called by better, just protecting against free cards can be can be worth it. That's fine in practice, um, especially in in a spot where I don't think. Justin or Michael have really been getting out of line with their check raises. However, in theory, if your opponents are apt to check raise, then over C betting might be a, you know, just C betting to deny equity becomes problematic. Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. Definitely depends heavily on your opponent's check raise percentages. I don't expect either opponent to be check raising him hardly at all in this spot, though. Like, Justin didn't even check raise with this hand, which is, you know, very close to top range. Right. Tough spot for Zach now, facing a, a fairly small river bet. Less than half. Yeah, it is tough. He, oh, he blocks some of Justin's almost blocks with his 10. He blocks 10-9 and queen-10, which are some of the more likely uh, floats that Justin would turn into bluffs here. Those look like calling chips, though. Nice pickup for Justin there. You guys have questions, comments. We are here. Use the hashtag Borgata Poker Live. Or add us on Twitter. Borgata Poker. We are here to chat. What do you think, Kane? You on Twitter a lot these days? I'm not the biggest tweeter uh, out there. I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll make a tweet if I'm appearing at a final table or broadcasting a final table or perhaps if something really interesting is going on in, in the world of sports, or cryptocurrency. But other than that, uh, not the not the biggest Twitter user. How about you? I uh, check it here and there. Yeah. Good good way to catch up on the day, you know, get some news, see what's going on in poker. Is that your favorite social media platform? Um. I'm not a big social media guy, I don't think. Yeah. But I, I guess. I mean, what else is there? I, I don't use Facebook a ton. I'm not an Instagram or Snapchat guy or anything like that. So. Yeah. Well, after losing a decently sized pot, picking up pocket aces is always what you want to see. 
Michael has been defending a, a decent amount of big blinds here. We'll see if 10-3 suited is strong enough. It is not. Not that time. I think it's Zach's ranges that should be a defend. Like, Zach's going to show up with so much weak stuff there. But, uh, you know, that time he tough had aces, hand. so he got... Tough hand to play out of position. You missed so many flops. Not a lot. You can't really flop by straight draws, you know. This tough final table as well because you have to face more bets out of position. But I, th sure. I think just, like, if you're just playing, like, the middle stages of some random tournament against a button opening, that's a pretty standard uh, defend there. I think he's actually the cut, cut off. off. Cut off there, but... Oh, cut off. Yeah. yeah, even so. Like, with Zach being the big stack and having so many opens in his range, his, his range is going to be a good deal weaker. But, yeah, cut off makes it. Zach continuing Zach to go again. to work here. Ace this time. Now we saw Zach just flat with pocket queens versus Joe. Will Joe do the same with two jacks here? I believe so. Looks like it. It's a pretty loose open for Zach under the gun here. We saw him get out of line a little bit earlier with I think it was 6-3. Yep, 6-3 suited. So he may like this position for one reason or another to open, especially if he thinks maybe Joe isn't through betting him. He has some... Tighter blinds. Zach will continue with his bottom pair. Yeah, I think this is a good spot to go ahead and, and bluff with your bottom pair. Really good turn card for Joe. It's an interesting spot because betting the flop allows you, if, when you're Zach, to uh, to really rep wider on future streets. Um, it's w it's it's a weird spot because it, it feels kind of strange turning bottom pair into here into a bluff. But if you just look at Joe's flatting range here. I don't expect that Zach would just win at showdown very often with a pair of sixes. No, there's very few hands he's going to actually be ahead of, I think. Maybe ace, ace jack. Yeah, an ace jack, jack or maybe. ace king. Yeah, jo Joe could be flotting ace king, I guess, given the stack. I, I would imagine he Not does. I assume Joe will be value betting the river here. With Joe, it's generally safe to assume he just does whatever is correct in any given spot. Ten seconds. Joe says. 1.25 Not a small bet. That is a large bet. I, I like this bet Dude, here. I mean, Joe spot. Joe can uh, Joe has all kinds of bluffs in this spot. Um, and he's going to bet the turn with a lot of queens. So I, I think going on the larger side makes sense here if we put hands like uh, King Jack suited, Ace Jack, Ace King all in Joe's range. Zach makes the call. Yeah, Zach does make the call. I think I would have. I think I would have called with Zach's hand as well. That way, it, it does come down to how light I think my opponent can value bet that river. It, if I think that Joe is capable of value betting a hand like 10 jack suited there. That's probably a little thin, I would think, for Joe. I mean, for anybody, but especially for Joe here. Joe having two jacks there is really nice. You think that, you know, Zach might have uh, an ace 10 or a king 10 or something that's going to have a much easier time calling to. That may have been why he chose to go larger. Do you like the turn check from Joe? I could be convinced either way. I don't think there's a a major, you know, you have to do one play or the other on the turn there. 
Um, I, I think that we've seen Joe try to keep pots a little smaller several times. So based on that seeming to be his strategy, his overall kind of, you know, mindset here, uh, approach to the tournament, then yeah, that's a good turn check. If you're the type of player that's maybe known for, you know, running some more bluffs, then I think you probably want to just start betting the turn. You start getting some value from a 10. Uh, you might want to bluff a lot of your, you know, king jacks and ace jacks and other hands that, you know, don't have a queen. So throwing the, those jacks into the turn betting range makes makes a lot of sense there too. Eric continuing his aggression. Pretty large sizing there from him, wasn't it? I did not see the uh, the sizing there. Uh, the was like BMW yeah, maybe I saw it cash and car sweepstakes here at the Borgata. You could win a BMW 320i cash or bonus slot dollars. This President's Day weekend, it's going to be a big weekend. Ten winners each hour from 4 p.m. through 8 p.m., including that BMW 320i car. That winner will be drawn at 8 p.m. Just insert your M Life Rewards card into any slot machine or play an open table game from noon to 7.30 p.m. February 17th through 19th for your chance to win. That is quite the promotion. Are you a car guy, Kane? Well, I, I am. Um, I, uh, I very, very recently moved to Puerto Rico, and I'm looking to buy buy a new car out there. Oh, don't buy it. Come come win your own BMW. <laughs> I can win we, my BMW. You can get it sent down I'll there. need to ship it out there. You'd be driving around Puerto Rico in style. What about you? What are you driving? Uh, I drive a Volkswagen. Okay. Yeah, I'm not not too much of a car guy. Cars get me from one place to another, and I can't wait to not drive a car ever again when self-driving cars take over. That's true. I am a big advocate for technology. Let's go. Let's go, robots. You move to Amsterdam and never drive a car again. Right here, just drive a bike. Yeah, everywhere. but I, I, you'd have to, I'd have to like pedal a bike then. That, that doesn't sound. Sounds like a lot it of. It is, uh, work. it is exercise. Yeah, it doesn't, that sounds terrible. So the button limping continues. Zach pouncing on that with the pocket tens. We have seen Zach in spots where he could raise over limps and take advantage of his big stack, opting instead to to just call. So when he does raise there, it, it kind of strengthens his range. And Eric correctly sniffs that out and folds the 9-5 suited. What's interesting is that Zach still has so many chips. He still has over 12 million over one third of the chips in play, but you know, he just lost a bunch of his stack. He probably doesn't feel great right now, especially they colored up those chips. I think it's always interesting to see how the chip color ups and things like players having a large stack and of physical chips and not having a large stack anymore um, can actually affect them and make them feel like they're even shorter than they are when he's still in amazing shape. So we'll see if it affects his play. Now, is that, is that a real thing? I, I noticed some very talented players want to have a lot of physical chips in front of them as an intimidation factor. I'm not quite sure what it is. A good example is uh, Zeno. I, I, every time I play with Anthony Zeno, I see that he's trying to ac accumulate a lot of small denomination chips. Is this something that could actually have an effect on the way that your opponents uh, perceive you or make them less likely to get into a pot with you, for example? Well, I think that... As someone who plays frequently, you know, a professional, you're probably going to be more accustomed to, you know, looking at larger stacks and being able to eyeball how many chips it is. So I think for someone like Anthony Zeno, who, you know, maybe he's saying, if I have a lot of these small chips, maybe it's tougher for my opponent to figure out how many chips I have, and they might make some mistakes in that regard. So I think that's one aspect of looking at it. Second, just having a lot of physical chips, you're able to build large towers and walls of chips and stuff. It can be intimidating, especially if someone, again, doesn't play a lot and they're just looking across the table at this menacing stack of chips. It can be tough. Yeah, it's one of those things that shouldn't matter but does because poker is played by humans. Yeah. It's a bit of irony in Eric using a 500,000 chip to bet 250,000 here, I think. <laughs> Gets 
Oh, uh, that completes Eric's flush. Wow, and what a check by Eric here. Zach is certainly going to bite after floating that flop. Wow, he doesn't. He checks back. Very surprised there. Eric takes it down. What do you think about that turn check by Zach there? He saved himself some chips. A little surprised to see that. Especially we've seen Eric just, I mean, bluffing and betting with bottom pairs and all kinds of stuff. I, I would think that that card of all cards is a card that he's going to give up on really a lot. So when I only had four high there, I, I think it's a spot that I would probably start throwing chips in. But Zach correctly navigates versus the slow play of Eric. I wonder if he picked up some sort of read. You saw right after the hand, Eric say, ah, I couldn't get you to bite on the turn, and Zach was like, nope. Yeah, I think I think part of it is that Zach could still rep pretty wide on the river. If he checks back the turn there, um, he would play uh, an ace-x hand with no diamond like that, for example, uh, where he would call the flop, check back the turn, and bet the river. So, Another interesting thing about that hand was uh, Justin opting just to flat the big blind with pocket tens. Do you guys like that there, or may you have gone for a three bet in that squeeze spot? It's a pretty enticing squeeze spot, and I'm not sure, you know, we're on a 30-minute delay. I'm not sure how quickly he's been getting uh, info relayed to him, if he is at all, um, while they're playing. But, you know, seeing Zach flat the 10-8, you know, would lead me to believe that he's flatting a little bit wider than some people. I mean, we saw Joe folds with 9-8 suited in the exact same spot, whereas Zach is calling 10-8 and 4-3. You know, so Zach's range is obviously going to be wider for flatting than some other players. Um, it becomes a pretty good spot to squeeze. I played with Zach on day three and day four, and what I noticed is that he flatted a lot of opens. And uh, w when the pot was squeezed, he, he rarely continued. So yeah. he's... He flatted a lot of open, not just with a big stack, but at all stack depths. He kind of likes to play post-flop and, and play in position. Both players flopping flush draws. This one could get interesting. Zach actually with the straight flush draw. Zach definitely in a trouble spot here, but he does still have a decent number of live outs. And of course, the nine of clubs would be his uh, his wish card here. Oh. That's going to pick up a few more outs there on the bottom end of the straight draw. He does opt to just see the river. Interesting check. I think I would have fired the turn oh there, and it is goodness. the nine of clubs on the wow. river. Oh, A straight Are flush for kidding? Zach. Yeah, Michael might be out of the tournament on this end. Quite different. Zach's like, high flush. do I really have a straight flush? You do, Zach. Hey, sometimes it's just your tournament, and I mean, you, you said earlier, Zach getting the runner runner full house at the ace queen. Now he has a straight flush. Real tough spot for Michael. This is I'm not sure what he can do other than just call. He's gonna think it over. You got to give him a little bit of credit here. This is a tough spot. Sure is. He does not have a lot of chips behind. He only has about, let's say, 1.7 million, 1.6 million. The tough spot for him is that he has he does a king. Make the king. I so he many makes the call, call and he'll get the bad news. And Michael <laughs> Martyr is our fifth place finisher here today after Zach Rivers, a straight flush. Michael played very well, and he'll go home with $181,329 for his efforts. His 75th career cash here at the Brigada, quite impressive. Yep, rough ending, but you know, sometimes it's just not your day. And that is his largest, will be his largest cash, both here and 
uh, on his tracked catches. So congrats to Mike. Quite the run. Quite the way to go out. My goodness. Definitely going out in epic fashion there. All right, I'm burning my jerseys. <laughs> Zach continues to, uh, well, can't really climb the standings when you're in first, but he continues to pad his chip count. Back up to 14.6 million chips here. And uh, the other players at this table, every player at this table uh, happy with the elimination of Michael as they now have moved up in the pay scale. Uh, fourth place is $240,250. So every player remaining at this table is guaranteed that amount. And as you can see now, uh, Brian, uh, Joe... Justin and Eric, all pretty similar stacks. There's a lot of ICM consideration here. Oh, yeah, certainly. And we might see uh, Zach try to take advantage of that and put a little bit more pressure in uh, some marginal spots here. But also, Zach is at the point where if he makes one misstep, he could be right back down to the rest of the pack, so he can't get too crazy. Fairly deep average stacks with uh, this stage of the tournament we have. I mean, even the shortest stack has over 40 big blinds. Zach, jack 10 off under the gun, raises it up. Justin and Justin continuing to play a pretty solid game here. Worked out well for him so far. Hasn't really stepped out of line much. Yeah, he's passed up on some opportunities. Um, for example, that pocket tens, he didn't take the squeeze there. It seems like he's very ICM conscious. As you can see up top, the Almighty Stack 200K Guaranteed Series is going on February 17th through the 20th. It's the Borgata Original Poker Tournament, typically held for poker opens. It arrives again on President Day weekend. Eric and Olympia blind versus blind, and Zach with one of the worst hands in Hold'em checks it back. Is this a hand you'd just be pitching in your small blind, or do you like the limp? I would limp normally, but I think against the big stack in this spot, I would. If we're just talking like random spot in the middle stages, I'd be limp. Well, Eric flops a gut shot. Zach with top and bottom pair here. You can't flop much better than that with six Dewey. Double gut shot for Eric, actually. So this could be a very, uh, very big pot, actually. Yeah, double gut shot. Excuse me. The raise is to 650. Eric quickly calls, and, and we've seen Eric uh, with his large draws just calling raises against Zach. We saw him do that earlier with the Ace of Spades. On the three spade board, the Queen of Spades on the turn. Two flush draws now on the board. And Zach's got to play this one really fast, because while his hand is fantastic, it is the type of hand that shrinks up very quickly on turns and rivers. So he is keeping the pressure on. Now Eric has to, even even if he hits one of his gut shots, uh, there's two flush draws out there, so he can't be super confident in all of his outs being live. Yeah, this is an interesting spot for Eric. I'd be inclined to take a calling line and then lead some rivers here. Um, perhaps Definitely an option. Perhaps lead a heart, having the eight of hearts in his hand, um, or lead a gut shots that he hits, or maybe perhaps even leading a five. The river I think if you are going to call the turn, you have to have some sort of plan like that, because you can't, you can't call the turn based on the, the draw value of your hand alone. Yeah, I never really... Like I never. About I never really used to do that very much in No Limit Hold'em, and then I, I, I started playing PLO, and uh, 
it really opened opened me up to the idea of, of taking lines like that in spots where you have a draw on the turn, but you don't have impetus, and, and you're taking a check calling line. Looks like he's using his time extension here. It certainly seems like Eric is thinking about making a play at this pot. Yeah, and if you're Zach, you're sitting there thinking, please don't bet, please don't bet, and then here's the bet from Eric. Wow, $2.5 million bet, and Eric has not been afraid to put chips into the pot in this tournament. Let's see what Zach does here with two pair. His hand is, is a bluff catcher at this point. Just a bluff catcher, yep. But he could catch this bluff. Eric definitely one of the players at the table most likely to have a line like this in his arsenal, I think. I mean, part of the problem here for Zach is what hands can Eric have that that don't have it? 5-8 uh, is a great example. Another one is 5-7. Um, is he limping every combo of 5-8 offsuit, or might he just fold some of those? These are all the questions that are going through Zach's head right now. Or is it possible that Eric is just turning a low pair into a bluff? Yeah, Eric's certainly going to have a lot more uh, heart combos than... All the different things that can be bluffed just be, by the nature of how many suited hands there are pre-flop. He's going to be limping with all sorts of suited hands and going to have a lot of flushes here. So it's not an easy spot for Zach by any means. Now, if you're Zach here, are you also thinking about... Zach <laughs> lays it down. Wow. What a bluff by Eric. And uh, he, he really he got that heart on the river. He's dumped it out. He shows the eight of hearts trying to <laughs> make Zach think that perhaps he did river the flush. Power poker by Eric. It's paid off so far for him. Yeah, him having a heart in his hand there does help him a little bit because it does it does cut down on the number of flushes Zach can have. Yeah, I, I like that play quite a bit. And I think the main consideration for Zach there when choosing whether or not to make that call, a lar very, very large consideration needs to be, does he think that Eric is just turning one pair into a bluff on the river like that? I, if Eric's uh, capable of showing up with 4-5, for example, and playing it that way, then it, he should really lean towards calling. However, if Eric's only combos are 5-7 and 5-8, um, which Zach doesn't even know if he, he limps both of those in the small blind, then uh, or all 16 combos of them, rather, the non-suited ones, then it, it certainly makes sense to lean more towards a fold. Yep, agreed. Also, the other thing that is always in your head in, in a situation like that is that your opponent is, is generally, the average opponent is much more likely to lead when he has it. When you river the flush there, um, you're much, uh, the average opponent is much more likely to lead than, than when they don't, um, if that makes sense. So there, there are lots of spots in live tournament poker where, um, you know, if your opponents are playing perfectly balanced ranges or if they have a, uh, you know, a balanced range where you, you know for a fact that they're going to take their 8-5 offsuit and lead it on the river, then you can uh, use combinatorics to break down their, their range pretty accurately. But, but there are just some spots where, you know, you think it's very likely that your opponent would lead the flush, but maybe he'd never lead with nothing. I don't think that Eric is that kind of player, but it's possible that that was something that was also going through Zach's head there. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of opponents in live tournaments who are only leading flushes there and basically don't have bluffs, so it, it does make it quite tough for Zach. Well, this is a loose call here in the small blind by Zach. Don't you think, Brian? That's... He was in the big blind, right? I, I, was he? I, I thought that... Uh, I thought that Joe folded his big blind. Oh, I may I may have seen the action wrong. Yeah, I, this I, would be a very loose it was, call. It was blind versus blind the last hand. He has to be. Small blind. He's going to have to show it here, too. Yep, you're right. Definitely a, quite a loose call from the small blind, for sure. loose call from the small blind. Especially with Joe McKeon in the big blind. <laughs> I mean, 
Yeah, I think you can call the small blind in that sort of spot wider than most people think you can, but 10-4 suited seems uh, too bad. Well, it's, it's possible that Zach has somebody watching the stream, and, and th that person told him about the hand where Joe just flatted the big blind earlier with ace-10 suited, so he may think he's more likely to realize his equity if Joe's uh, three-bet value range in the big blind isn't quite as wide. However, we of course That's a big did, consideration. We did see Joe three bet bluff with the eight deuce offsuit. Of course, that was not a squeeze spot. Eric with the exact same hand he had two hands ago. Let's see if he is attached to this hand now. Nope. Eric really showing how how he's done so well in these WPTs in the past. Really putting the aggression on when when he needs to. Definitely a fearless player. And we're back to limping. Zach limping the button with 5-4 offsuit. Joe McKeon. Queen Jack suited, he just calls. What do you guys think about this yeah, call? I guess Zach is just assuming he's not getting raised very much here at all, so he's kind of getting out of line. But I mean, it's, he's not he's, getting raised. It makes he's sense. He's clearly right if Joe's not raising Queen Jack here. I mean, if I were Joe, I, I would have for sure bumped this up. Why just call? I, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, it, it could just, be that he's just trying dynamic, to... I think. Yeah, I could just, could, he could just be trying to play some more smaller pots. Um, that's definitely a possibility. You know, the, that same trend that we've been seeing with him this whole final table. He does not want to mix it up with a big stack and play a large pot. I, I think this hand is just far too good to be allowing yeah especially if he's if he has a scout telling him the type of stuff zach's been limping with even if he doesn't i i would still this would be an auto raise for me River card is an eight. Both players making a straight here on the river. Wow, a very good check by Zach there. Yeah, I think the flush comes in. He's got the bad end of the straight. If that's not a diamond, I would imagine we're going to see a bet. But uh, honestly, I probably still would have bet. I, yeah. I would think it's pretty hard for Justin to have a 10 there. Even a flush, you know, that he didn't bet the turn with the flush draw. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, it, it's close. I, th I do think the flush, the presence of the flush makes it a lot tougher. Yeah, I, I think without the flush, we certainly would have seen a bet there. I think I would have been tempted to, to bet there, although I'm not sure what, what's right in theory. Certainly a defensible decision. Zach's still right on the horse, though. Opening Queen Jack. He's been, been slipping a little bit in the chips, but he still is the chip leader by a good, good margin here. Really, it shows how large his lead was. Just in the small blind with King Five offsuit, not going to do anything. That's some thought. I'm kind of surprised he didn't just snap fold there. Maybe he's just thinking that Zach is getting way out of line and he can start three betting light. But that hand is not really good for much. No, not a great hand. I think he's also been playing on the tighter side, so he was maybe thinking, you know, hey, I can maybe use my image a bit. Zach's been losing some chips. Might be a good spot to put on some pressure. And it's out 175,000. Very small bet from Eric. Zach not going anywhere with top pair. Eric showing another, pulling another trick out of his bag here. The He's lead. got all the tricks. He does. He really has used all of them. Eric makes the call. 
Oh, Zach raised. I'm sorry. I didn't even realize. Zach raised the flop? Yeah, it looks like it. Eric, Eric let out incredibly small, so Zach raised. And Eric will make a pair, but that's not going to be enough for him. Will that go for value? We saw him check the low end of the straight last hand, but it looks like he's racing for chips this time. Wow, quick call from Eric. And Zach got him good there. Yeah, that was a, a good one by Zach. Really can see that he kind of tricked Eric there with his flop raise and then turn check. Eric most certainly did not have him on top pair. Must have thought he was making some sort of move with a, you know, flush draw or something like that. Yeah, Eric, Eric had the six of clubs in his hand, which does block some of the bluffs he's hoping to see there, but still plenty that Zach could have. Follow along the whole Winter Poker Open at the Borgata Poker blog. Not only this event, but all of the events. There's still a few events left on the schedule. Lots of good uh, pictures and stories from this whole series. You are watching the WPT Borgata P Winter Poker Open 2018. I am Michael Gagliano alongside Kane Callis and Brian Paris joining us remotely from Amsterdam. We've had a great final table so far. Five professionals and the self-proclaimed amateur. Quite the show. Yeah, it's been an interesting one. That's Who's impressed sure. you the most this final table so far, Brian? Um, I'm just going to have to take the easy way out and go with Joe, I think. I mean, we haven't really seen him make a mistake at all. Every time he's made a decision, he's pretty much been correct. I got to say, Eric's impressed me a lot, you know, just with all those different types of aggressive plays. A lot of times when you have a player that is playing very aggressively, they tend to do the same thing a lot. They tend to either raise a lot pre-flop and then bet a lot post-flop. You know, they just kind of bet, 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 you know, that kind of style. Or you have guys that three bet a lot, and then all they do is three bet, and then they bet, and they give up, you know. But Eric is really weaving his aggression in in different ways, which has been really interesting to watch. Yeah, as far as people who I, uh, you know, wasn't, wasn't, weren't already aware of how great they were, I would definitely say Eric has, has been very creative in his approach to his final table, and his uh, raw aggression has really worked out for him in a lot of spots. Eric, of course, the WPT Seminole Hard Rock champion, 2014. You ever get a chance to go down there, Brian? I know you're over uh, in Europe, but it's a nice event. I have not played uh, much in Florida at all, actually. I haven't played at Borgata either. When I was living in the States, I was on the West Coast, so I played a lot in Vegas, a lot in California. You got to get over really here to the East Coast. Thank you so much. Run some good tournaments, some good WPTs over here. That's what I hear. I hear great things about Florida. Is that right? Kane told me that was the biggest WPT I th we think ever. Yeah, live poker is still thriving. A trio of nice high card hands here. Justin slightly with the best of it, but Zach actually has the best percentage here pre-flop, and he will improve that percentage on the 6-high, 2-diamond flop. <laughs> Comment from the YouTube chat that you don't see as much conservative play online as you do here at the final tables. Uh, two parts to that question, Brian. First off, do you think that that's true? And second, why do you think so? I don't think that's necessarily true. I, I just think that the average stacks online are much shorter, which means that you're going to see a lot more action. Okay. It's pretty rare to see final people online with the average stacks being this deep. So you think it has more to do with stack depth rather than the player type? Yeah, and also, and also just like 
even if you're playing for like a really big prize pool online, you're very, very, very rarely going to get anywhere near how much these guys are playing for. So we're going to see a little bit more caution with all these pay jumps being so big. It's very rare that an online tournament has a prize pool anywhere approaching this one. Yeah, do you think it has anything to do with those pay jumps? Do you think that the, the pay jumps may, you know, make people just a little more cautious? Even though... Oh, yeah, I mean, certainly they should be a little more cautious, I think. Uh... But when you when you combine the fact that the stacks are so deep with with how much they're playing for, I think I think caution makes a good deal of sense in this sure. spot. Sure. Sure. Nice river for Justin. As he will make the best hand. I guess he had the best hand technically the entire way. Nice Zach, not considering the bluff, it's king high. Yeah, it's a lot easier to call with this one than with the, with the ace high, but it does not actually change uh, whether he's winning. And Justin's going to take it down. Zach's still with over 90 big blinds, but Justin is moving up in the standings. He's second place now with 60 big blinds. Yeah, Joe been pretty quiet since he lost that that large pot earlier. Seen the slow him down a bit, but he's still right in the running. This this is a wide open tournament, honestly. I think it's really. Oh yeah, certainly. Still. Even even with uh, Zach having a big lead, it's nowhere near insurmountable. Blinds are up, I believe. Uh, well, we've been up since the level started at 150k. I, I don't think they're up again just yet. Oh, I thought I just heard him announce it. I think they heard him say something else. Oh, with a nice hand here in the small line. Ace, eight of diamonds. We'll see if he continues with his uh, flatting tendencies or if he decides to three-bet this one. Given how weak Zach's button range is, it seems like you want to be three betting to punish it. But on the other hand, you know, inflating the pot out of position is not necessarily what you want to be doing. I'd be a little confused, honestly. I mean, we've seen Zach limp a few fairly weak hands, so that that should generally make his raising range a little stronger. But I guess he's just playing so many hands that it's still pretty weak. Yeah, and Joe's gonna take that one down pretty quickly. Yeah, I think that now that they're four-handed. And stacks are a bit more even. Joe is definitely going to be willing to mix it up a little bit more. And maybe not mind playing some big pots against Zach, but we'll have to see. Yeah, I believe that's the first time he's three bet Zach uh, the entire final table, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I think it is. He has three bet against Eric before. Back with a nice hand here, ace six of diamonds, or hearts, excuse me. Zach raises, makes it 375,000. Joe calls. Joe just calling here with the sevens and Justin behind with ace king. This could be a big one. We're almost certainly going to see a squeeze from Justin. The only question is what size. Once again, you hear the buzzer go off. He just will be required to forfeit one of those time chips. He's got a few to spare. I don't think he's really been in any tough spots yeah. yet. Back over to Zach. He's well behind in this hand against his two opponents. He will make the fold. Now, Joe with a little bit of tougher spot. Uh, Joe's folding based on that. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, with how tight Justin's been playing, seeing Joe get out of line there would have been pretty surprising, I think. Well, it depends on how you define the best hand. Joe with the Queen Nine of Diamonds. I expect we'll see him raise this one on the cutoff. Yeah, four-handed, you're going to see these players. You know, the he, he's technically under the gun, but under the gun is the cutoff four-handed here. So we're definitely going to see a lot of a lot of opening from all these players from that position. Zach will come along. They will go heads up. Both players with the diamonds. So Zach way out in front, but he has sort of a weak showdown type bluff catcher hand. Joe is going to start with a bet here. Let's see how much pressure he decides to bet. apply. Yeah, Zach definitely calling the first bet. The turn we go. Ace on the turn. Although I know help to either player, it does make Zach feel a little better about his hand, taking a few more aces out of the deck for that Joe could have. And Joe just going to give up pretty easily there. I don't blame him on that board. You know, it's it's pretty tough to get Zach to fold the king. It's about fairly large. Yeah, especially once the ace pairs, I think I think it's a pretty yeah. good spot to just give up. If the ace doesn't pair, he has more options, especially if the turn is a ten or a jack. Question from the YouTube chat. I remember an online player, one of the originals way back when with the name B. Paris, wondering if this is the same B. Paris. It is. Indeed. Brian has been playing. It is indeed. I'm, I'm doing uh, Twitch streaming now as well if you want to catch up Brian's on what I'm doing these days. Brian's been a crusher but. for quite some time. Yeah, Twitch, twitch.tv slash B. Paris Poker. I'm on there uh, five nights a week. So if you guys want to watch my current MTT exploits, just had a pretty good month in uh, January. Hoping to keep it up. Yeah, that's one of the cool things about doing these uh, American tournaments is I can, you know, reconnect with a lot of people who I used to play with back in the day before Black Friday happened. Absolutely. It's always always fun seeing the, you know, the guys that have been around forever still crushing it. I mean, me and you used to battle all the time. We did. We played a lot of tournaments back in the day. Zach with another button limp here. Joe raising with a pair of nines and showing it. And now the blinds are going to be up. Here we are. And I was a little bit premature on that one. 100, 200,000 with a 25,000 ante. That's a reasonably large increase. It's going to, uh, you know, push the action a little bit here. See the chip distribution. Zach's still the chip leader, although that pack is getting closer to him. Much more even fields right now, and this is uh, this is my favorite point in the tournament. Honestly, I, I love four-handed play when everyone's got about 40 big blinds and it's even like this, because it really feels like anyone's game. And there's yeah, just so, so this many, is where the uh, the true champions are made because yeah, there's so many there's marginal so many spots. interesting hands and just like you know if you can find those those nice bluffs and those nice call downs. 
make a hand here and there. You could just win the tournament four-handed a lot of times. Eric raises, makes it 425,000. Joe with two nines, back to back hands here. What will he do? Reaching for raising so chips here. Joe is going to squeeze here. You see the chips. Those are the chips remaining behind. So Joe has put in 1.5 million with 5.8 behind. Eric announces a four bet. Wow, wow Eric, at this. Going, going hard here. He's got a uh, so Eric percent of his stack. Yeah, he he can't, he can't fold now, right? There's some debate if Eric's raise was large enough to be a legal raise. Uh, I, I believe it is. Yeah, they're, they're, he's they're forcing him to commit. Our our graphics are correct. Uh, they they it looks like he tried to make it 2.5, and he was told he had to make it. 2.675. Now Joe in kind of a tough spot yeah, here. Yeah, this, I mean, this, this is tough. So he flats. Like I, I, I like around. that. He's probably suspicious of Eric uh, having it here. And he's got a lot invested. He's getting a very good price to see a flop. Something like 5 to 1. And Eric gets there. This so the pot is really, six, really big 6 point one part. million. Joe has about four point six behind. I can't imagine that Joe's going anywhere now. Not, probably not for nine fifty. He's gonna at least call this one with the backdoor spades as well. That's nine hundred fifty k. I I can't see Joe doing anything here. Wow. He quickly lets it go. Four by Joe. Wow. What 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 do you guys think about that? I don't I I think that Joe is you know knew he was getting a good price pre and and was really looking for uh, maybe a safer flop. Um, that was a pretty. I mean, I mean you, you know I would think anything without an ace for king is pretty safe. You're trying to maybe just be ahead of ace king, but maybe he thought the queen was just a little too scary still. The other thing with Joe is, I mean, you have to assume that he's got some sort of live reads on everybody with how successful he's been live. So he, he definitely could have picked something up on Eric on the flop versus pre-flop. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm, not, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not the biggest fan of that there. If I, if I were Joe, I would have been all in on that flop. Well, you would have been you would have been all out of this tournament. <laughs> well, I had backdoor he, spades. It's true. <laughs> Eric did connect with that board and, and make the best hand. Uh, I think that... I think that with a hand like two nines there, I think there's a little that can be said for, hey, you know, let's just let's just put the money in pre. Let's make our decision there. If you think Eric is white, you know, maybe making a move on you, just put it all in there. If he's got ace king, you're going to have to just run it um, or just fold because you get too many of those situations. Uh, well, hang on because Joe's going to have another situation. Wow. Ooh. Joe goes all in here against Zach. He gets snap called, and Joe is uh, about a three to one dog here, all in with his ace jack against the suited ace king of Zach. Yeah, very standard spot here for Joe to rejam with the ace jack. Just unfortunate to run into it, especially with how weak Zach's ranges have been overall. It's very unfortunate to run into a strong hand like this. Here's a flop. Five, six, Not a good queen. flop good for Joe. Joe. No hook for Joe there. Loses one of his outs in the jack of clubs. Joe in rough shape here. He is going to need jack of spades or diamonds to stay alive. 
The Rivers in 10, and Joe McKeon has been eliminated in fourth place as Zach continues to add to his stack here at the final table. Rough spot for Joe there, but he played a hell of a game. Just got unlucky in a few big pots where he uh, got it in with the nuts against the set. Joe McKeon takes home $240,251 as our fourth place finisher, and he, he played very, very well.